To be involved in WrestleMania at all is looked at as an honor to most sports entertainers, but it has to sting just a little bit when one year you're in the main event or a major world title match, and then the next you're thrown into some random mid-card scrap or perhaps excluded from the show altogether. A lot can happen in 12 months, and sometimes the slide doesn't stop there. Talk about WrestleMania moments to forget. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 biggest WrestleMania falls from grace. Join us! Number 10. Randy Savage The WrestleMania resume of Randy Savage is as impressive as any other. He had that Intercontinental title classic with Steamboat at 3, won the vacant world title by winning a tournament at 4, dropped the title to Hogan in the main event of 5, was forced to retire after putting over the Ultimate Warrior in a thriller at 7, and then was back the next year to beat Ric Flair for the WWF title in a blinder at 8. Despite continually proving that he had what it took to deliver magical matches and moments on the grandest stage, or right, and the Sapphire and Dusty Rhodes mixed tag at Mania 6, WWE opted to put the Macho Man behind the announce table at WrestleMania 9. While some fans may have enjoyed listening to Savage's gravelly voice during the broadcast, Randy himself yearned to be in the ring and resented being turned into a commentator while he believed that he still had a lot to give between the ropes. He may have escaped the toga treatment, unlike broadcast partners Jim Ross and Bobby Heenan, but he could have contributed a lot more by, say, having a match with someone like Razor Ramon, who was instead saddled with Bob Backlund in his Mania debut. Number 9. Bray Wyatt the booking may not have always been favorable towards him, but Bray Wyatt did get to interact with some absolute legends at the show of shows. His first Mania outing was a loss to John Cena at 30, a controversial result that fans and critics pointed to as stunting Bray's momentum. The year after, Wyatt put over The Undertaker, with fans again voicing their belief that the upstart should have gone over. At Mania 32, he was in a notable segment with Cena and The Rock, where the Hollywood guys easily dispatched the entire Wyatt family. And then the Eater of Worlds entered WrestleMania 33 as WWE Champion, defending against Randy Orton in one of the evening's main event matches. Unfortunately, this was the match that WWE's production staff decided could use some images of bugs superimposed on the ring canvas, and it's destined to be remembered as one of the biggest letdowns in Mania history. Bray himself must have felt rather let down when he walked into the Superdome in New Orleans for Mania 34 since he had been relegated to a spot in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal on the pre-show. Number 8. Batista and Umaga A two for this time as the collective fates of Batista and Umaga saw them tumble down the card and into a match with each other. Now, under normal circumstances, a meeting between a pair of big beefy hosses like the Animal and the Samoan Bulldozer doesn't sound half bad, but it would be disingenuous to say that the promotion behind their WrestleMania 24 match was anything but half-hearted. A battle for brand super their Raw vs SmackDown clash was a rushed and sloppy disappointment that neither man was happy with when all was said and done. Contrast their place on the card with what they had been tasked with a year prior, and you can see why. At Mania 23, Batista defended his World Heavyweight title against The Undertaker in a cracking match that exceeded all expectations and came close to stealing the show, despite it being put slap bang in the middle of the card. Umaga, meanwhile, was in the most heavily promoted match on the pay-per-view, representing Mr. McMahon in the Battle of the Billionaires showdown with Donald Trump's pick Bobby Lashley, a match that also featured Stone Cold Steve Austin as special guest referee. Number 7. Sergeant Slaughter Tensions in the Middle East back in 1990 presented Sergeant Slaughter the opportunity to turn heel as the military man became an Iraqi sympathizer and, as part of his new push, beat the Ultimate Warrior to win the WWF title at the 1991 Royal Rumble. He couldn't stop the awesome force of Hulkamania, of course, with Hogan coming to America's rescue by ending Sarge's tyrannical reign as champion in the main event of WrestleMania 7. Slaughter and the Hulkster continued to feud for the next several months before Hogan and Warriors saw off Slaughter and his baddie buddies in a handicap match at SummerSlam. Sarge's heel run had obviously peaked, meaning that there was only one thing to do, turn babyface once again by coming crawling back to his country. Teaming up with fellow Patriots Hacksaw Jim Duggan, Virgil and the Big Boss Man, Slaughter was on the winning side of an eight-man tag match at Mania 8 as the babyfaces saw off the foursome of the Nasty Boys, the Mountie and the Repo Man in a let's try and get as many people on the card as possible type attraction. Not a terrible spot by any means, but nothing like a marquee match with the Golden Goose, brother. 
Number six, Dean Ambrose. Even when it's not the actual main event, a WrestleMania match with Brock Lesnar is bound to have some serious hype behind it. And the no-holds-barred street fight between the Beast and the Lunatic Fringe at WrestleMania 32 was certainly promoted on the promise that fans would see total and utter carnage in Texas. That quite infamously turned out not to be the case, as Lesnar decided to play it safe and gobble up the X-Shield member en route to a rather predictable victory. Ambrose was outspoken about Brock's perceived lack of effort in the match later on, the then reigning WWE champion telling Steve Austin on his WWE Network podcast that his opponent at the granddaddy of them all pretty much shot down every idea he was presented with. Come WrestleMania 33, Lesnar was challenging Goldberg for the Universal title, the two having an explosive banger that was honestly one of the best things on the show. Ambrose, on the other hand, had to settle for the pre-show, where he defended his Intercontinental title against Baron Corbin in a humdrum match that nobody remembered five minutes after it was over. Number 5. Lex Luger There was every possibility that Lex Luger could have left WrestleMania 10 as WWF Champion. The total package was still getting a major push as the red, white and blue would-be successor to Hulk Hogan and was one of two men, along with Royal Rumble co-winner Bret Hart, to receive a crack at Yokozuna inside Madison Square Garden. Luger choked again, however, while the Hitman ended up triumphing and getting paraded around the world's most famous arena by the rest of the babyface roster. Fast forward one year later and the Lex Express had officially run out of gas, as Luger was little more than a bit part player, taking a backseat to the likes of Hart, Shawn Michaels and Diesel. At WrestleMania 11, the former WCW heavyweight champion barely made it onto a show headlined by NFL player Lawrence Taylor. Tagging with the British Bulldog in the show opener, the so-called Allied Powers scored a routine victory over the Blue Brothers in a match that had no storyline juice behind it and basically just happened for the sake of happening. Perhaps his diminished role at WrestleMania helped convince Luger to jump back to WCW less than six months later. Number 4. Fandango the WrestleMania nadir of Chris Jericho probably ended up being the biggest moment in the WWE career of his opponent, Fandango. The ballroom dancer and Y2J got into it over Jericho's inability to properly pronounce Fandango. Was that good? Leading to a match at Mania 29. This was not only Fandango's first WrestleMania, but it was also his televised WWE debut. Well, as this gimmick anyway. I mean, no disrespect to the memory of Johnny Curtis. Jericho was already miffed that a planned program with Ryback had been cancelled, making him the first and only person in wrestling history to be upset at not getting to wrestle the big guy. And his mood didn't change when Vince McMahon told him he would be putting over Fandango on the night. Not only did Fandango get the W, but his catchy theme music also became the soundtrack of WrestleMania weekend, as pissed up punters continued to sing it well into the night. The momentum couldn't sustain, however, and Fandango found himself making up the numbers in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal the next five WrestleManias, three of which took place on the kickoff show. Number 3. The Big Show a month after making his WWE debut, Paul White booked his place on the big show, pun intended, when he went up against Mankind in a match to determine who would be the guest referee for the WWF title main event between Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. A year later, the world's largest athlete would himself compete for the world title in the show's headliner, though he was the first man eliminated in the four-way a McMahon in every corner elimination match. At Mania X7, Show wasn't anywhere near the world title picture, but he still got to compete for some gold. Well, sort of gold anyway, because he was scrapping with Kane and Raven over the Ramshackle Hardcore Championship in a fun and chaotic triple threat. Show couldn't make it four consecutive WrestleManias on the bounce, however, as there was no space on the bill for him at Mania 18. Instead, Show was sent to the company's Times Square restaurant, The World, some distance from the Sky Dome in Toronto. He wasn't injured or anything, the company just didn't have anything better for him to do than hang out and eat food. Sounds like a dream gig if you ask me. Number 2. The Miz 
In a list of unlikely WrestleMania main eventers, The Miz sits somewhere near the top. Oh, a list of unlikely WrestleMania main eventers, you say? I'll add it to the to-do pile. Anyway, as I was saying, the real world's Mike Mizanin, the man who was once despised by his colleagues and kicked out of the WWE locker room, wrote his name in the history books when he headlined WrestleMania 27, defending his WWE title against John Cena. Miz may have been a third wheel in the real story between Cena and WrestleMania host The Rock, and he may not even really remember the match at all after legitimately getting knocked out towards the end of the contest. But the record shows that Miz beat John Cena to retain his WWE title in the main event of WrestleMania 27. You can bet your candy ass The Rock took center stage at Mania 28, while the now former WWE champion was shoved into the 12-man tag match to determine a general manager for both Raw and SmackDown. Representing Team Johnny, Miz may have ended up scoring the match-winning pin, but rubbing shoulders with the likes of Hornswoggle, Santino Morella, and David Otunga was a far cry from dancing with Big Match John. Number 1. King Kong Bundy the first WrestleMania wasn't a night of epic matches, but it did create many memorable moments. One of them was King Kong Bundy's demolition job of SD Jones, setting an early record for shortest WrestleMania match at just 24 seconds. It was quite the upward trajectory for the super heavyweight after that, as he went from squashing a geek one year to main eventing opposite WWF champion Hulk Hogan in a steel cage match the next. The WrestleMania 2 experiment, three shows from three different locations, was wasn't exactly a triumph, and Bundy vs. Hogan is not exactly fondly remembered by fans, but you cannot take the accomplishment away from the menacing 450 pounder. An even bigger and more menacing man took the Hogan spot at WrestleMania 3, of course. As for Bundy, well, he teamed up with Little Tokyo and Lord Littlebrook to lose to Hillbilly Jim, Little Beaver, and Hazy Kid via DQ. It would take eight years, but Bundy would exercise those demons by, well, uh, quite easily losing to The Undertaker's clothesline at WrestleMania 11. They just don't write redemption stories like that these days, do they?